little over 22 years ago, I stood in a small room at the police academy and I took an oath. And like many of my colleagues who do what we refer to as the job, I've seen all manner of things, many of which will never leave me. I've seen humanity at its best, but I've also seen humanity at its absolute worst. Along the journey, I've had the great privilege of working with an amazing group of people who've dedicated their lives to answering a call for service that was perhaps best espoused by President John F. Kennedy in his inaugural speech with the famous words, ask what you can do. The passion I felt that very first day still burns bright. It's taken me from walking a beat to the hallowed halls at Harvard. And it was there that I wondered if our traditional hierarchical model of policing would enable us to meet the level of complexity that future threats are likely to present. I believe we need an innovation revolution in policing, one that enables us to keep pace with our increasingly digitised and networked society. We need to create a safe environment, removed from frontline policing, where we can become truly innovative. Imagine empowering police with the same culture of fail fast and fail often that guides innovative companies like Alphabet X. So please join me as we peer into the future and consider the impact of technology upon policing. It's a beautiful summer's day in Perth. The temperature's approaching 40 degrees Celsius. As you look west from the coast, the ocean is that stunning combination of deep blue and turquoise hues. It seems like everyone's at Scarborough Beach enjoying that most quintessential of Australian pastimes, a swim at the beach. A family returns to their place on the sand to discover their towels have been moved and their keys mobile phones and wallets are missing. They quickly gather their belongings and move to the car park where they realise their worst fears have come true and their car's been stolen. They borrow a phone and they call police. After two rings, they're immediately connected and a voice says, Police Assistance Centre, how may I help? They provide their personal details and start to tell their story. And at various stages, they're prompted to provide more information by a calm, reassuring, professional voice. Simultaneously, in the background, their bank details have been lawfully accessed. Suspicious transactions are identified, and information relating to these transactions, including digital imagery, the time, what was purchased, and any closed-circuit TV images are captured for evidentiary purposes. Their mobile phones are also lawfully accessed to ascertain any interaction with cell towers. Fixed and mobile automated number plate recognition cameras are used and updated with details of the stolen vehicle. All this information is brought together and synthesised and a pattern emerges, providing a direction of travel and an approximate search area for the suspects in the stolen car. A police drone is immediately deployed. Unlike our current aerial assets, the drone can remain aloft for days at a time. It is equipped with high resolution digital cameras that enable it to provide facial recognition in real time it can also identify number plates, make, model, year and colour of vehicle. Shortly after arriving in the search area, the stolen vehicle is identified, the suspects are identified and the closest police vehicle is dispatched and they're taken into custody. This has only taken minutes from the time the original call was received to the drone deployed and the officers effecting the arrest. The interesting thing in this scenario is the only human involvement was when the police officers arrived on the scene. That helpful voice was an advanced version of Google Duplex, adapted for public safety use. The information that was taken in, that was accessed to identify evidence, to deploy resources in real time, was enabled by artificial intelligence, particularly deep learning, a subset of AI, that was then used to access remote areas, identify that evidence, capture it in an evidentially secure manner. Once this occurred, Police were then provided with an electronic case file upon arrival with all that data there ready for them. Currently, this process can take weeks due to the sheer volume of offences police are dealing with and the analogue manner in which we capture and deal with data. However, for this to be successful, police need to retain trust with the community, particularly with regards to the lawful access of private data. And where necessary, we need contemporary legislation to ensure this occurs. It's somewhat of a paradox then that as a community we willingly upload some of our most private data to social media platforms without any of these checks and balances, somehow trusting that they will keep our data safe. 
Data is becoming one of the most valuable commodities in society today. We are becoming dual citizens of both the physical and the digital realms. A simple Google search, of which there are 3.5 billion per day, indicates Facebook has in excess of 1.47 billion daily users. There are over 500 million tweets generated daily. The community treats digital data as their property, akin to their physical property. And when something happens to it and it's stolen or misused, there's an expectation that the police will take some form of action as we would for a physical property crime. This extends to our roadways with the arrival of the self-driving car. Imagine a scenario where a human is killed or seriously injured in an incident involving a self-driving vehicle. How are police to investigate a technology we neither understand nor have the requisite skill set to assess? And it's unlikely the community will allow technology companies to investigate themselves. So again, police will need some form of artificial intelligence that is deemed neutral and acceptable to the community. It may sound far-fetched, but imagine a future where a human police officer is teamed with a robot whilst out on patrol, overseen by a dispatch center that is enabled with real-time artificial intelligence. The threats from the digital realm may also manifest in the physical world. And one of the most disruptive of these will be additive manufacturing, or what is commonly referred to as 3D printing. The two key areas this will impact upon policing are firearms and illicit narcotics. A recent decision by the United States Supreme Court saw that it was lawful for a US website to host plans for 3D guns. This is currently subject to a federal court order. The challenge here is that this may provide an avenue for people previously denied access to firearms, including those currently under court orders for domestic violence, with a venue to access virtually on traceable weapons. This is going to present significant challenges both for the community and for police, as the number of illegal firearms in the community may increase. The other area that 3D printing will rapidly alter is it has the potential to completely disrupt the illicit narcotics black market. Imagine being able to 3D print drugs anywhere. All you need is a source code and the raw materials, which may not be illegal. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission identified in 2015 and 16 over 21 tonnes of illicit narcotics were seized. This is an increase of over 78% over the previous decade. A team at Glasgow University used a 3D printer to create chemical reaction vessels, which they then used to produce medicine, showcasing the benefit of this technology for humanity. But imagine if it was repurposed to produce illicit narcotics. This has the potential to completely disrupt the existing physical drug distribution network for illegal narcotics as we know it replaced by a source code which becomes the commodity of value. Existing law enforcement methodologies focused on identifying illegal firearms and illicit narcotics, both at the border and in the community, may prove less effective in this scenario, as encrypted code can be sent direct to the end user, enabling them to customise and then manufacture illegal firearms and illicit narcotics in their very own home. The potential effects and impact upon the community and our health system could be devastating, and it is unlikely to be negated by legislative measures alone. I've briefly spoken to some of the emergent challenges that police may face, but there are many more that are yet to be conceived. In order for police to protect the community from such future threats, we require highly adaptive organisations one where a culture of innovation is fostered and prized. And who knows, in the future, police may even rival startups as hotbeds of innovation for the benefit of all. Thank you.